Um, okay, yay. So this week we are working on, hello, hypothesis testing. Uh, so um, hypothesis testing is the other basis that we are taking from, uh, we did confidence intervals last week. Hypothesis testing is gonna be basically um, moving a little bit forward from that. It's another thing that you have to know the basis of it for us to move on to the more um, complicated things later on in the semester. We always build upon that. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're studying that you need to understand these uh, basic different parts for confidence intervals and hypothesis testing for us to move forward. Um, so these are very important here. So um, just a quick review. Sorry. <laughs> um, that uh, categorical variables are going to go with population proportions, while quantitative variables go with population means. Um, this is something to keep in mind because if your um, question is asking you something about um, proportions you, or asking you something about a categorical variable, anything with a label to it, that's going to be a population proportion. When for quantitative variables, that's going to be a mean. So if you're talking about anything with a value in it, then you're going to use um, a mean. So when we write our hypotheses, as we'll go over, you're going to use um, the letter P, um, this actually, the symbol P for categorical variables, and then for means, you're going to be using mu. And these are, once again, the population um, symbols for these uh, respective um, proportions or means there. Alrighty, so, um, and like I said, we were trying to get this basis between um, confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, and just to compare the two, because often this is something that is confused. Um, so confidence intervals is that range of values. So remember, when we do our confidence intervals, we are getting that range of values from our lower bound and our upper bound. So our lower bound is gonna be, um, it's going to be lower, comma, upper when we write the, um, la like the actual answer for a confidence interval. And then our conclusion is, do we think the value is in this range? And then we say we're a certain percent confident that it is in this range here. But then hypothesis tests, the difference is it's only one single conclusion. So there's a difference. Confidence intervals is a range. Hypothesis testing is one conclusion. And then we're deciding if the conclusion that we found is significant or not. So that's why we're going to either reject the null, which we'll get into, reject the null, or fail to reject. Um, yeah, so that's the two di the difference between confidence intervals and, and hypothesis testing because later on you're going to have to decide that when you have a set of data and you're trying to figure out what kind of test you want to use, you do want to know um, which one you have to use in terms of these different tests there. So let's keep trucking. All right, so when you're writing a hypothesis, you have your null and alternative hypothesis. So this is, um, these are the two that you're basically trying to make a claim about. So your first claim is going to be talking about um, that there's no change in the data. So your null hypothesis that is that there's no change. So basically for proportions, the only options for your null hypothesis um, is gonna be HO, and then you're either gonna have that P equals something or that um, mu equals something. Um, because we always have an equal sign for our null hypothesis. Um, that's just rule of thumb because we're saying there's no change. So that means that our proportion is gonna equal the um, whatever value you have, or a mean is going to equal whatever value. So remember, this is for quantitative variables. And then this is for um, categorical. So keep that in mind. And um, so yeah, just saying that there's no change for our null hypothesis. And then um, for alternative hypothesis, that's going to be um, saying that there is some sort of change. And that sort of change is going to be one of these three options. So basically, we can write P, so for our alternative hypothesis, when the options I'm writing down here, we can have P is less than something, or mu is less than something, or we can have P is not equal to something, or mu. And you see how I'm using the, um, I'm using the population um, symbols, the mu and P, not P hat and X bar, you don't wanna use those ones. Um, and then, or P is greater than a value, or mu is greater than a value. So these are the options you can use to write your null hypothesis for a one proportion or one mean. We'll get into that later on um, when there is you know, two proportions and this and then that. That's what I'm saying, you have to understand these initially or else um, the rest isn't gonna make sense. So yeah, that's the difference between writing our null and alternative hypotheses. Um, and yeah, so there's the alternative ones. All right, and please stop me at any time if you guys need any clarification. You're in Lydia's room, <laughs> that's okay. Yes, I am, I am Thursdays, hello. Thanks for, thanks for coming by. Um, yeah, boop, boop. Okay, all we talked about so far is just to catch you up. We just talked about 
uh, categorical variables being for proportions, quantitative being for means, and then comparing confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Um, our confidence intervals are range, hypothesis testing is a single conclusion. And then we just talked about writing them. Okay, so for hypothesis testing, yeah, not a problem. So after we do a hypothesis test, we're trying to decide if it's either statistically significant or not. So for statistical significance, um, if we do find that it is statistically significant, we're gonna say that our answer that we got is probably useful. It is significant, so it's shown that there's actual differences in the population, because remember that our conclusion is always about the population. Um, if you remember from earlier, I always draw this kind of um, cycle. So we have our population, and then we take a sample from that population. And then based upon this sample, um, we're gonna make an inference about the population. So whenever you do your conclusion, if it's a confidence interval hypothesis testing, no matter what, you do have to say something about, you know, we're 95% confident that the population mean or proportion or whatever, and then you wanna make sure you're using population, not sample. And then same for um, hypothesis testing, you're gonna say we fail to reject the, the null or we reject or whatever, saying that we think that there's a change in the population at, or at the, that there's no change. So um, that's what statistical significance means. And then our p-value is something you're gonna see very often. Um, this is gonna be a, a smaller number usually. Um, we want it to be small because the smaller it is, the um, more the more confident we are that there is some sort of change. So it, the technical value is it, or the technical uh, definition, excuse me, is the probability that the statistic or one even more extreme than that that we found is randomly obtained from the population. So um, if you think about it this way, sometimes that um, definition confuses people. So I would suggest thinking about it in uh, whatever way makes sense to you. It's basically saying that the probability that that statistic that we found when we took it from the population and we got a sample and then we used a statistic from that sample, the probability of that one or something even more extreme is randomly obtained. So it was what we got makes sense and it was randomly obtained. It wasn't by chance. It wasn't just because. It wasn't because there was a confounding variable. It was truly because there is some sort of change. So that's why we want our p-value to be low because we don't want um, something to be we don't want there to be a high probability that something was, um, that it, you know, it was obtained because of like a compounding variable or something. So we always want this to be small, um, no matter what. So we'll talk about that a little bit more next. So, so yeah, so when is it statistically significant? So now we know what that means. Um, and statistical significance, uh, when we're trying to find out what it is after we make a, um, so we usually use the alpha as 0.05, this font will let me write it correctly, but. Um, so this is uh, 0.05 or 5%. Um, that's what we often use as our alpha level. Um, so that's kind of saying that we're giving it a 5% um, error rate, basically. So um, if it's to be statistically significant, our p-value has to be less than or equal to alpha. So often, which is 0.05, like I said. And then, and then another way to think about the p-value, I like to say things in a bunch of different um, ways so that you can... Uh, you know, sometimes it makes sense to people differently um, for different definitions. So, uh, so the p-value, this is a conditional probability. So remember, conditional probability has this line in here, which means given. Um, so if we were to read this, it's the probability of rejecting the null, given that the null is true. So, which is what we want, because saying the null is true, saying that there's, or th this isn't what we want. <laughs> we don't want the p-value to be, because we want, don't want it to be high, because the probability of rejecting the null, saying that there is a change, when in reality, there is no change. So we don't want that. So that's why we don't want this probability to be high because we don't want a big probability that there's um, a change in the population. Or we don't want a big probability that we basically incorrectly rejected the null. Um, we'll get into type one and type two errors later, but that's something to keep in mind that's gonna be related to that there. All right. Boop, boop. Okay, so when you get that p-value, um, you know, we understand that we want it to be small in order for it to be statistically significant, but if we're actually interpreting it, um, so like I said, if, so if your p-value is greater than alpha, which is not what we want, um, then we're going to fail to reject the null. We always assume that the null is true on um, the second bullet here. We're always going to make an assumption that the null is true, so we're always assuming that there's no change because we're trying to prove that there is some sort of change going on. So um, we're assuming that the null is true given the information we have, and then, so if our p-value is greater than alpha, there is a large chance that there was basically, it was due to like random sampling error, that there wasn't actually a change in the population. And then, um, so that means that we can't conclude that there's any change, which is why we're gonna fail to reject and keep this assumption that the null is true. And remember the null is saying that there's no change. So that is how we get that. Um, and then remember, if our p-value is less than or equal to alpha, then we are gonna reject the null. What 
reject, send help. <laughs> Am I okay? Reject the null. Um, so that's gonna say that we think that there is a change um, in the population. Yes, change. So yeah, that's how we interpret our p-value. All right. Oh, we're gonna do some review questions. All right, so let's start with our first review. So in a detailed hypothesis about a population mean with a sample size of 100 and alpha equals 0.05, the rejection region will be where? So as a hint, this involves the empirical rule. So um, try thinking of it that way. So go ahead, read through these answers, try to solve it, and then we will review it then together. Good answer, Dave. Not right, but it's <laughs> a good answer. Wait. Um, okay, so let's let's uh, go over this. So, do do do. Where's my thing? Okay, so with our um, when we're talking about two-tailed hypothesis tests, and so our um, our alpha is 0 0.05. That's our rejection region. So that's saying if we draw a normal bell curve here, that's saying that we are given, and this is two-tailed. Remember, so that means that we're going to have um, it shaded out here. So um, that means that this, these um, together, the shaded regions have to equal 5% five, 5 total. Um, so that means that the center of this is gonna be 95%. So technically if we actually do this, this is 2.5%, 2.5% because they have to equal five, okay? And then the center here is 95%. And if you remember from the empirical rule, which is my favorite thing in the world, um, if we, so, and these can technically, so the answer is C because 1.96, we often round it up to two. So plus or minus um, two standard deviations from the mean shows that there's 95% of the data um, lying below that. So, um, but we can use 1.962, um, like I said. So um, we can assume then, according to the empirical rule, that 1.96 is gonna be on these two values here uh, because 95% of the data obviously lies between them. And then this is saying Z is less than negative 1.96, so this shaded region and this shaded region, which is what these two ones are. Does that make sense how I solved that? No. Okay. Bop, bop, bop. So on our normal curve, remember, when we have a, um, for, like for our Z, Z curve, if I were to draw this out, remember we have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And then remember, if we have um, plus or minus one standard deviation, Remember, this was 68% of the data. Do you remember this from the empirical rule? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so remember, our empirical rule has um, the idea that we have um, plus or minus one percent, or plus or minus one standard deviation is 68% of the data, and plus or minus two. So this is t we can we also call this two. You know, it's we round it up is going to be 95% of the data. So that's why if I all this away. Okay, um, so that's why when I did plus or minus two or um, 1.96 standard deviations from the mean, so we'll call this the mean here, so plus 1.96 and then minus 1.96, remember that means that there's 95% of the data in here and our rejection region is 5%, but since it's a two-tailed test, we have to have both of these tails. 
okay? So total, they have to add up to 5%. So that's why I said each of them is 2.5. And um, we know that if between plus or minus one standard, or plus or minus two standard deviations or 1.96 standard deviations, we have 95% of the data that makes sense. So the middle is 95% and then our rejection region has to be this 5%, so um, 2.5 on either side. So that's why we're able to make that conclusion that our rejection region is this shaded area. So um, Z is less than 1.96 and then Z is greater than 1.96. Does that make more sense? I would review the empirical rule if this doesn't make sense. Yeah, even so Hey, you, I'm sorry, I wanted to ask you, where did you get that 1.96? Yeah, so that's from the empirical rule. So I would review the empirical rule. That's, th these are like constant numbers. So plus or minus 1.96 is 95% of the data, plus or minus one is 68% of the data, like I put there. Um, and then if the, no, 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 oh yeah. Sample size doesn't matter in this case because this is standardized, okay? So rem you should go back um, to the last review that we did um, for confidence intervals and review that empirical rule because that's going to tell you because these are constant numbers on this curve. Um, so, yeah, I would review that, and I think this will make a lot more sense because these numbers are, like, constant. We're always going to use these numbers. Um, so that's where we got that from. So, yeah, I would try reviewing that, and this will probably make a lot more sense then um, for you. So is that okay with everyone else? Any other questions? I'll assume no. Okay. All right, let's do another one. All right, so a researcher claimed that feeding cows a half a pound of bananas every day will help them to lose 8.5 pounds after one month of treatment. Nice. If we want to conduct an experiment to determine if the cows are losing less weight than advertised, which of the following hypotheses should be used? So read through these answers. Uh, let me know what you think uh, the null and alternative hypotheses that we should write are, and then we will review it then together. Okay, let's review this one. Okay, so remember that our null hypothesis always has seven equal signs, so we can immediately cross out D and E because these have not equal two signs, which is no bueno, we don't want that. And then this is saying that um, we wanna lose less weight, whatever, whatever. So um, losing 
less weight than advertised, that means that we want to have the less than sign. Okay. And then also keep in mind that we can we can rule out B because our alternative hypothesis can never have an equal sign in it, okay? And so we're between A and C. Um, C has to be our answer because it's talking about losing less weight than advertised. So it's saying that mu is less than 8.5. 8.5 is the um, pounds that were advertised. Um, so that's why our answer is C there because A is would be if they were gaining weight or something like that, which is not what we're talking about. We are talking about losing weight. So that's why our answer is C there. Does that make sense how I came to that conclusion, everyone? Yay. All right, cool. All right. All right, so review number three. So a hypothesis test is done in which the alternative hypothesis is that more than 10% of a population is left-handed. The p-value for the test is calculated to be 0.25, which statement is correct. So we're basically making a conclusion based upon that p-value. So I'll go ahead and try this one out and I will let you guys know what it is then. Good job. Yes, our answer here is D. So, uh, so based upon our p-value here, so our p-value, which is um, 0.25, is going to be that's greater than our alpha, because um, we often say that our alpha is 0.05. Remember, so if you're not given it, assume it, assume it's 0.05, and um, since it's greater than our alpha, that means we're going to fail to reject. Reject. No. So um, if we fail to reject the null, remember the null is saying that there's no change. Um, so we're failing to reject it. So we're kind of just saying that we're still gonna assume it's true. So that's why D is uh, correct, because it's saying we can't conclude, we can't make any conclude conclusion that there's a change, which would be more than 10% of the population is left-handed. We're trying to see, um, so the alternative hypothesis, we're trying to see that um, it's more than 10%. Um, so our null hypothesis would have been written as um, P is equal to 10%. And we're basically saying since we're failing to reject that, we're going to still assume that this is true. So we can't make any conclusion that there is a change going on there. So that's why our answer is D there. Does that make sense to everybody? Woohoo. Yay. All right. Let's do one more here. So true or false, if the p-value is greater than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. So this is just kind of a, a take home uh, based on the information. So, all right, ooh, y'all are, <laughs> you guys are on top of it. All right, so p-value, we reject the null. Yep. So, okay, so you guys are saying true. So p-value greater than alpha. So what was, what happened in the last, in the last one, what happened when our p-value, so remember in the last one, Oops, p-value was um, point, 0.25, right? Right, so that was greater than 0.05. So what do we do in that case? Do we reject the null or do we fail to reject it? Fail to reject. <laughs> we wanna, yes, we wanna fail to reject the null. We're saying failing to reject the null means that we're still assuming that there's no change because there's a high probability that there's some sort of like confounding variable in there. So we want, <laughs> I know, come on, Mary. No. <laughs> so um, yeah, so our p-value is greater, like if it is greater than alpha, um, if it's greater than alpha, this means that we, we're going to um, fail to reject. 
Um, so this is going to be false, actually, because um, we want our p-value. In order for that to be true, our p-value has to be less than alpha for us to reject. Um, because we're trying to find a difference in the um, in the population, but if our p-value is too high, we can't say that that there, we can't infer that there's some sort of difference there. So we're going to assume then that our p um, that the null is still true, that there is no change if our p-value is greater than that. So this is false. Does that make sense to everybody? <laughs> when the, these are um, problems that you got kind of got to do over and over and over again and then you'll start like hearing in your head and then one day it's just going to kind of click the more you do the problems it'll uh, make sense conceptually um, and that'll be okay but definitely I suggest making sure you get this um, these basis for confidence intervals and hypothesis tests and then um, we will and then you guys will be good for the rest of the semester then there so but yeah I think you guys are on the right track um, just practice, 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 do your homework in your labs. Um, so yeah, so recordings of these sessions are going to be um, on the YouTube channel as always. Our next group review will be on Thursday, uh, next Thursday at 10 o'clock for lesson six. Uh, so we're going to go a little bit more in depth into these topics. Um, I think everyone gave me their Penn State email, so thank you for that. If you guys have any last minute questions, go ahead and ask. Um, Q&As are also good places to ask those that um, schedule is on the um, website for the notes. And um, so if you guys don't have any other questions, you guys are good to go for tonight.